Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So we're delighted to have uh, Parag Patak here today. Um, and I'm very disappointed by uh, all of our colleagues for not, not being here. But uh, <laughs> uh, we're still thrilled to have Prague. We're also even more excited to have him as a CR every Friday uh, this year. So um, today's going to be, uh, sorry, Prague uh, is basically the leader uh, among uh, young economists in the field of market design, which is very important. Uh, to many people here, and he's a recent winner of the uh, Social Choice and Welfare Prize, uh, and soon to be winner of the John Base Clark Medal, <laughs> is my prediction. Uh, and uh, well, pressure is on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, today he's going to, I guess, give us a bit of an overview of a big agenda he's been developing in a very multi-method uh, and, in some ways, interdisciplinary way around improving uh, urban public schools. Great, thank you so much, uh, Glenn. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to be talking about some things that may not be on the um, central part of Microsoft Research's agenda, but I hope you'll find it interesting nonetheless. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I'm a professor of economics at MIT, and um, together with uh, two of my colleagues, I direct uh, the School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative, um, SEII we call it. And this is a group of economists and um, graduate students and research assistants that study issues related to uh, the income distribution in the U.S. and uh, the role of education in, uh, in the income distribution. And uh, the part that I've uh, spent a lot of time focusing on is understanding uh, the productivity of K-12 through public education in the United States. And that's what I want to tell you a little bit about. So uh, today's talk, I'm going to briefly touch on a bunch of studies, so you should stop me at any time. Um, and um, I'm happy to have this be, be a conversation. So let me set the stage a little bit with uh, some early debates about urban school reform. And uh, one of the most important um, kind of landmark events uh, when people thought about uh, schools in America was a report issued in 1966 by James Coleman. So for those of you who don't know, James Coleman is a sociologist who taught at the University of Chicago. And, uh, is seen by many as one of the first sociologists to embrace quantitative methods. Okay? Um, and uh, he was commissioned by the Department of Education in the wake of uh, Brown versus uh, Board of Education to actually survey high schools throughout the U.S. and try to understand uh, whether or not uh, they were being faithful to desegregation uh, decrees. And uh, he issued this report, a pretty landmark report in social science, actually, called the Equality of Educational Opportunity. And that report is widely seen as making the following argument. Um, uh, that argument is student background and socioeconomic status are a much more important determinant of educational outcomes uh, than measured differences in schools. Uh, that is, when we think about what determines achievement of children and later life outcomes, uh, their parents and their neighborhoods matter a lot more than, than schools. Um, and so this was a, a pretty provocative uh, 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 point of view, uh, and uh, has, sh has kind of shaped uh, research studying uh, school effectiveness uh, in the decades since 1966. But immediately after Coleman's report came out, um, there was a, a reaction. Uh, so one kind of type of reaction came from this quote I have here from uh, Martin Luther King. So two years later, uh, he said, stated the following. He said, whatever pathology may exist in Negro families is far exceeded by the social pathology in the school system that refuses to accept a responsibility that no one else can bear and then scapegoats Negro families for failing to do the job. The job of the school is to teach so well that family background is no longer an issue. So Dr. King here is uh, rejecting the uh, kind of implication of the Coleman report that schools cannot do much to change the dial uh, in uh, student achievement. And so if we look at what's happened since uh, uh, the 1960s at uh, various measures of uh, achievement differences, we see pretty strong evidence that 
uh, black and Hispanic students still score substantially lower than whites uh, in all grades, okay? Um, uh, there's evidence that these differences emerge by age two, so there are studies that try to test measures of cognitive ability at age two, so those aren't very sophisticated tests, but by the time you get to kindergarten, uh, black students in nationally representative surveys are about two-thirds of a standard deviation behind uh, in math and uh, about 0.4 standard deviations behind in reading. Uh, these differences grow as we get older, so by the time we get to high school, the black-white achievement gap is uh, about 0.8 or uh, one standard deviation depending on the survey. And there's been almost no progress on these gaps uh, in the last 40 years. Black students in white families, uh, no, so the gap is, tends to be smaller. Uh, it's basically what you expect. So this is an unconditional statement, black versus white. Uh, if you look at rural areas, for instance, the gap tends to be a little bit smaller. Um, another thing people often look at is inco the income gradient, and um, <clears throat> there's some discussion that the gap between rich and poor is a much more salient uh, um, division than the, the gaps between races uh, nowadays, whereas it wasn't like that um, <clears throat> in, the, in the early period. So that's, that's kind of an ongoing debate. Um, and so when we look at these gaps, uh, um, <clears throat> we see that you know, public schools still struggle to close these gaps. And uh, the question that uh, motivates a lot of our agenda in the lab is the, that of whether schools alone uh, can ever close achievement gaps. Uh, is Coleman right, or is there a role for uh, schools to um, uh, uh, push the dial here? So what we'd like to do is know uh, what makes a good school. You now everyone has views on this. Uh, uh, is it the teachers? Is it the, the principals, the governance, the human capital policies? Is a school a good school because there are talented peers? Uh, uh, or is it that it has small class sizes or computers in the classroom? Uh, or is it the types of educational philosophies? What do they teach? Um, and so there are many things that go into what we call the education production function. Uh, and what we try to do at our lab is to try to quantify uh, um, <clears throat> school effectiveness before we can try to think about what would change uh, or increase the effectiveness uh, of schools. Now, this may seem like an easy problem, figuring out what makes a school effective or what is an effective school, but in practice, this is a very uh, uh, challenging uh, problem. Uh, and it's a problem that has confounded policymakers in a number of settings. So one of my favorite examples of this comes from New York City. So in New York City uh, in 2002, uh, there was a landmark change in the governance of the public schools. So the mayor at the time was Mike Bloomberg, and he appointed Joel Klein to be the chancellor of schools. So Joel Klein at that time knew very little about public schools. He was actually most famous as the Department of Justice uh, Attorney General who uh, busted up Microsoft. <laughs> 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 and uh, what Joel did is he brought in uh, a lot of uh, upstarts, uh, upstarts, McKinsey graduates, MBA types, into the public schools. and. Um, he started a, a, a big push towards centralizing control in the public schools. And um, that's actually uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the time that I got involved in some work with the New York City public schools. Um, that was 2003. A couple years later, uh, the Klein administration put out this big initiative to rate high schools. Uh, actually, not just high schools, but elementary and middle schools using these new data systems that they had developed. And so they put out these uh, uh, report cards for schools uh, in the 2007-8 school year. Okay, so every school was rated A, B, C, uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, D, or, or failing. And the idea was if a school was rated failing, uh, then they would have to do something about it. Okay, and this is part of a nationwide movement, uh, sometimes associated with the No Child Left Behind Act, to start rating and holding schools accountable for their performance. So now that we have tests, uh, maybe we have the opportunity to do this. So let's take a look at the distribution of report cards in the New York City Progress Report System in the first year and in the second year. Yeah? Yeah. What makes a good school seems a little bit of an ill-posed question because you might ask, what makes a good school for whom, right? And so I'm sure you've thought about this, but there's yeah. sort of a natural sort of sense of matching and heterogeneity and treatment. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's, I mean, that's kind of the second step of the question. So what makes a good school? 
uh, for whom, uh, in what context. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you something uh, on that specifically today. So we, I think we have some evidence of schools that seem to be successful for certain types of students that probably are not going to be successful for other types of students, okay? So let me come to that, okay? Uh, let me continue to tell you the story of New York City because this is a fun story. So they developed this formula uh, to rate schools. Uh, and so here's our distribution of grades in the first year. Uh, that's the blue line. So you can see 45% of schools are rated A, uh, about 35% uh, are rated B. The red line is the f what happened in the second year, okay? And miraculously, that happens to be <laughs> an election year. Uh, the number of schools that are rated A goes from 45 to nearly 90%, okay? So what happened in New York is they changed the formula, uh, I think. Uh, perhaps it's cynical for me to say. Uh, is it cynical to worry about grade inflation? Or perhaps the Klein-Bloomberg reforms were so successful that all these schools improved. And, you know, there's this old law of uh, Don Campbell, the famous uh, sociologist that people call Campbell's Law. It says the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision-making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to, to distort and corrupt the social processes that it's intended to measure. And I think New York City's report card uh, episode is an example of that. So what we try to do instead of coming up with uh, uh, these report card type formulas is uh, come up with methods that allow for objective assessment of, of school effectiveness. Okay? And so our, our research program has done a lot of work studying the charter sector uh, and um, other types of uh, school models. So I'm going to talk a lot about charter schools and then touch a little bit on exam schools in the time that I have. OK, so yeah, question. Uh, yeah. Question. Uh, you're not saying that this happened in your data. It almost certainly didn't. But suppose that your methods were to come to be the standard way of evaluating schools. Yeah. Do you think there's any way that you could manipulate uh, these quasi-experimental measures by screwing around with the scores in such a way that you could make your school look better by putting people on sides of this continuity who don't really belong? I, I do think there, there are ways. I, I think we haven't gotten to that point, but a, <laughs> a, a very obvious thing that I worry about is we tend to find this result that weaker kids benefit more from going to charter schools. Uh, and so that's based on the lottery. So we say once you apply, let's compare those who, who've won and who've lost. So it's objective in the sense that we can do, if we say starting at the application point, what's the effect of the school? If I'm a very sophisticated uh, school leader and I want to look better in the rankings, then uh, I can go out and try to target the kids who seem to be benefiting the most from my school. Now there's a question of whether that's good or bad. So if it's indeed the case that these are the kids who benefit the most, maybe that's an investment we want to encourage. Um, I haven't seen any direct evidence of, of that kind of thing there's, happening. There's one reason I raise that is yeah. because a lot of people here are interested in questions of like adversarial inference, where you're trying to like infer some statistical process, but like you're not playing against nature, you're playing against someone who's like deliberately trying to screw with it. Uh -huh. And uh, so it seems like a relevant Yeah. So let me tell you a bit about charter schools. So charter schools are uh, um, maybe the most significant education reform in the United States right now. So uh, about um, in the last four years, there's, there's been over 1,000 new charter schools that have been authorized in the United States. Uh, more than 5% of kids currently in the US go to charter schools, OK? Uh, so what's the idea? So it turns out the idea actually originates with um, uh, <coughs> um, Al uh, uh, Shankin, who used to be a, uh, the leader of the AFT, the major teachers union in the United States, his idea was, well, let's try to experiment within the public schooling sector. And let's let anyone who wants to start a school um, be able to run a school. It's going to take public funds, but it's going to be held accountable. Okay? So a charter school is basically a privately managed public school. Uh, so it's a school that's privately managed in the sense that they have autonomy uh, in terms of how they can hire and fire staff. Uh, they have autonomy in terms of what they teach. But they are subject to some regulations, like students have to take standardized tests. If, public, if a charter school is not seen to be uh, um, uh, achieving what they set out in their charter, they can be closed. Uh, uh, okay, so. The regimes that charter schools face uh, differ by state. So let me tell you a bit about Massachusetts. So in Massachusetts, there are no for-profit charter schools. 
So anyone, including you know, Microsoft, for instance, could propose a charter. We would apply to the state. We would say, these are our goals. This is how we're going to staff ourselves. Uh, this is uh, um, what our budget's going to be. And uh, typically, if the charter is approved by the state, we would get a five-year contract. Okay? Uh, and then after five years, we'd be uh, reauthorized. So um, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, nine out of 75 charters that were granted through 2011 uh, have actually been lost. Okay? So sometimes that's because of financial misdeeds at the school. So that happened at a Springfield charter school. Other times, it's because of poor performance. And uh, uh, occasionally, that's been due to just lack of demand. No one wants to go to the school. Okay? Now, the reason why charter schools are very controversial, uh, one reason is that uh, they typically operate outside of local collective bargaining agreements. Okay? So the teachers who work at a charter school uh, are, are most frequently not part of the union. So uh, charter schools can therefore f hire, fire, and um, behave very much like private schools in terms of managing their teacher staff. Um, <clears throat> now, just a bit more context about Massachusetts. So you might have seen in the governor's race uh, some discussion of the charter debate here. In Massachusetts, there's a cap. So no more than 35% of children uh, in urban areas uh, of the city are allowed to attend a charter school. So that restricts entry of charter schools. And there is a very heated debate. Uh, I mean, every other day in the Globe, you'll see an article about the charter cap, uh, where uh, proponents of charter schools and their expansion want to change uh, the charter cap. Okay, so. Um, uh, the governor came out last week saying we should eliminate the charter cap and uh, encourage more schools. Now, the concern against that is uh, if you have a district that's majority charter, what's going to happen to the host public schools? Will they be able to achieve economies of scale? Uh, and who will the kids uh, be who are left over? Okay. So one of the interesting things about charter schools is the way they admit children. So in Massachusetts, by law, uh, a charter school must run a fair lottery uh, when there are more applicants than seats. Okay? Um, now, there's actually no provisions in this lottery. Uh, it, it's a fair lottery. So uh, you might have seen movies like Waiting for Superman, where children are waiting to get their uh, uh, chance to go to one of these charter schools. And that's what happens here. It's decentralized. Uh, they're literally drawing numbers out of a hat, or some schools have a little bit more sophisticated uh, randomizing uh, uh, devices. Uh, and so what's nice about this from the research uh, angle is that this lends itself to a, a, you know, a very rigorous comparison among those who apply. We want to say, what's the effect of going to a charter school? We simply compare uh, those who are offered a seat to those who are not offered a seat. Uh, because a lottery number is only manipulating your opportunity to attend a school, and it's unrelated to things like your family background, uh, your motivation, it's just a random number draw once we look at the set of applicants. Uh, we can uh, attribute differences in achievement between winners and losers to the uh, uh, opportunity to attend a charter school. Okay, so uh, this is uh, something that's made research on charter schools uh, expand significantly. Uh, it's like we have a clinical randomized trial in medicine. And so let me just tell you a little bit how this works in the, uh, one of our studies. And this is the, the first study of a KIPP school. So uh, you may have heard of KIPP. KIPP stands for the Knowledge is Power Program. This is the largest charter management network in the United States. So they operate more than 200 schools. They were originally founded in Houston, but now they are throughout the nation. And until uh, three years ago, there was only one KIPP school in, in New England, okay? Uh, and that was in Lynn. Um, okay, so Lynn, for those of you, has anyone been to Lynn, Massachusetts? Lynn, y yes. Yes, so Lynn is famous for biking trails, but it's also famous for this old ditty, Lin Lin City of Sin. Uh, it's a city that used to be an old uh, uh, kind of uh, <coughs> a manufacturing town that's seen better days, I think it's fair to say. So um, what did we do in this study? So we went to, to um, Kip Lin and uh, got their admissions records, OK? And we wanted to reconstruct what happened on lottery night. Now, in principle, this is a really simple thing to do, OK? In practice, it's incredibly difficult, OK? Because there's no, little or no oversight on lottery record keeping uh, uh, at, at these schools. And uh, the typical strategy we would do is we would get the records from the schools. Uh, often these are in Excel spreadsheets with different colors. There's the person who ran the lottery is no longer there. So we have to do our best to try to convince ourselves that we have actually reconstructed what happened on lottery night. So at Kip Lynn, we had 
629 applicants from uh, 2005 to 2008. Uh, and so we process these files by removing uh, guaranteed applicants or repeat applicants or applicants that we cannot match to state records. So one thing we have access to is records on everyone in the state. So we end up focusing on children who are first-time applicants uh, that have baseline information. So that's information on their um, race uh, and their gender. Um, and so what happened at this school is of those 446 applicants, uh, 303 were offered a seat and 143 were not offered a seat. Now the next thing that happens when you look at those who are offered is not everyone who's offered goes to the school. Okay? So this is the idea of partial compliance. Okay? So in fact, at this school, 73% of those who are offered actually attended KIPP. And on the other end here, 143 of those who are not offered uh, five of them somehow found their way into the KIPP school. Okay? So we actually have non-compliance on both sides. Okay? Not everyone who's offered goes, and not everyone who's not offered does not go. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so what do we do? How do we handle this? Well, what we do is um, uh, the technique of instrumental variables. Okay? So this is uh, uh, something that uh, I, I think some of you are familiar with, uh, probably all of you are familiar with, but uh, the idea is to adjust for partial compliance, okay? So uh, the, the way this works is we take our numerator here, we say of those offered a seat, the 227, uh, what's the average score of those kids? Now remember, not everyone offered a seat actually goes to the school, okay? So we find that their average score is minus 028. How can you have a minus score? We've standardized scores to have mean zero, standard deviation one. What about those who are not offered? The average score there is minus 0.381, okay? So if our question is, what's the effect of an offer? We can, how long after they join? Uh, it's just one year. Yeah, yeah. So these are kids who are lotteried in fourth grade, and they take an MCAS test in, at the end of, um, uh, after one year. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So our score here is the state of Massachusetts has a standardized test called MCAS, and this is after one, one year. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so if our, our question was what's the effect of an offer, we can just look at the numerator. Uh, if instead we want to ask what's the effect of attending or enrolling in uh, KIPP, we have to uh, uh, divide by the difference in take up between the two groups. Okay, so uh, this is the walled estimator, this is instrumental variables, this is the local average treatment effect, uh, it's all the same thing. So here the difference in this example is 0.815 for those who got an offer. And as I mentioned, some of those who didn't get an offer actually enrolled in the school. So that's how we've adjusted for partial compliance. And in the end, the numerator divided by the denominator gives us uh, uh, the effect of, um, for this cohort, uh, of enrolling in KIPP of 0.46 standard deviations. Between people offered who got in and the people offered who didn't, who didn't enroll. That's right, yeah. And it's really important that you took, because if you look at this, it's huge. Uh, I mean, they're different questions, if you want to say, right? So, biologists would call this the intent to treat or the reduced form, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying that it. You have to deal with partial compliance. Yeah, not everyone takes their offer uh, at these schools. And in fact, actually, at this school, the, the take up rate's even typically higher than what we see in, in other settings. So, um, and you, yeah. I mean, you probably expect there to be a, a difference in, I mean, it's not random. Like, like the ones who get in and don't go probably are, like, have less, you know, their, their, their parents care a little. Yeah, but, I mean, it turns out but this solves this problem. Yeah, right, exactly, right, right, because right. we get the score. So of these right. offered, many of them don't go, but we still get their score. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. They go somewhere else? Yeah, so they go back to Lynn Public Schools. Some of them move to a different district. Um, mm -hmm. um, so that, that turns out to be somewhat significant, and that's why you, you need state records to be able to follow kids in other districts. For, for, do you do it just based on uh, actual uh, attendance? Yeah. Do you find that there is a significant selection bias in the attrition or not? Uh, so if I look at who... Uh, so you did it not based on intent to treat, but just on the treatment? Yeah, there, there isn't, no. no. There isn't. Not, no, most of these kids are not opting for private schools, so we can get scores for all of these kids. It's a very disadvantaged population, so uh, I think that's a big part of it here. So, um, so this is how this works for you know, one set of applicants for one grade. Uh, we have a couple of years of data from this school. We have many test outcomes, so we can pool all of this together to get 
uh, an average effect. And when we do that, um, we find that KIPP Lin produces achievement effects of uh, about a third of a standard deviation per year, okay, in math. Uh, now, is that a large effect or not? So I already mentioned that the black-white achievement gap in Massachusetts uh, for middle school is about uh, 0.8 standard deviation. So our per year effect of KIPP Lin uh, is enormous. Uh, in fact, if we were to extrapolate this per year effect uh, for two to three years, that would be enough to close the black-white achievement gap. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no. So Kiplin is uh, uh, mostly like black and Hispanic. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's about 80% black and Hispanic. Yeah. Question? Uh huh? I'm curious about, since there's a rigorous demand for charter schools, is there a perception by the parents that there are greater expectations by the students and the principals? I mean, by the teachers and the principals. At the school here. Yeah, because I mean, it's crazy. I would never want to teach at one of these schools. So we, we've gone to the school many times. Yeah. The, the teachers at the school are on call till 11 p.m. Uh, every weekday. So any child is having any issue, they have to be available by their phone. Okay, and so... Uh, That's kind of two extremes, because the students I talk to in Boston, like Charleston, Dorchester, Roxbury, they suffer from extreme, extraordinary boredom because of the... Are they at charter schools or at... The public schools. Yeah. Because they're like, they're dying. I mean, they're starving for some intellectual stimulation. Yeah. And I hear that, I mean, it's unscientific, but I hear that consistently that the ex incredible low expectations for the students yeah. contribute a lot to a lot of them dropping out just from boredom. Yeah, I, so I think that's part of the story. I wouldn't be surprised if Lynn Public also had mm -hmm. some of that going on. At, at KIPP is known and it's iconic because people call these no excuses charter schools or some people call them paternalistic charter schools. Uh, mm -hmm. They're schools that basically keep you there a lot. So your school year is much longer your school day is much longer. You come in on weekends. You wear uniforms. It's, it's kind of a boot the camp. Kind of thing that Rowan Fryer found is very right. He found all these factors that mm -hmm. are highly correlated yeah. with school improvement, and so you're saying the school <coughs> implements that basically. Uh, I, I mean, this this is emblematic of that, actually. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, Kip invented this, is what I'm saying, I actually. See. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, yeah, go ahead. Did you say that uh, gains of this size will cause the, that's a series of like, you know, perhaps. We can extrapolate, effect. sure, yeah. This is a per year effect, and in these studies. Perhaps causing the, you know. The that's right. We tend to see that the first year effect's larger than right. second and third year effects. But although, in general, I mean, we're, we're getting this dose-response relationship, so it's hard to actually do this extrapolation without some more assumptions. But, but yeah. do you believe that two, three, two or three years? Uh, I'll show you another thing that'll, uh, Blow your mind in just a second, okay? Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, I remember this uh, problem from a few slides back. Didn't the wasn't there a data point that said that the average student stayed enrolled for 1.25 years? Um, where was this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So th this is just an example of this. So the the final estimate is different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, if I take this group here. Most people do not stay throughout. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's a great question, actually. So uh, sometimes people worry that going to one of these schools, it's so kind of uh, much of a boot camp. Why would I stick around at these schools? So I can say a couple of things about that. The first thing is this method is not compromised that, by that because even if you leave after two years, we would get your score from the state database and we would attribute you to being at getting an offer, right? So you would be on the, um, <clears throat> you know, you'd be in this uh, cell right here. But the other thing is in terms of interpretation, right? So uh, maybe these schools are doing so well because it's very easy to educate once we've kicked out all the troublemakers. And uh, what happens uh, uh, at KIPP, actually, and, uh, and in um, Boston sample is uh, so many more schools, um, that you're actually no more li uh, likely to switch out of school if you got an offer uh, at a charter school versus uh, another uh, traditional school. So this, this facts that people point to, this, uh, you know, people are switching schools. They would say KIPP, you know, 30% of KIPP's incoming class is not there in year two. Um, our point on that is uh, you need to benchmark that against another traditional public school. And it turns out that in another traditional public school, the movement rates are, are, are similar. And uh, the fact is this is just a really highly mobile population. So usually those facts are not quoted in context. Uh, so when we look at the causal effect of uh, getting an offer on school switching, we see almost no evidence that you're less likely to 
uh, that you're more likely to switch because you're being kicked out of the school. Yeah, yeah, Josh? I'm, I'm confused about the connection between the denominator on this slide and the numbers on the previous slide. Based on the previous slide, I thought this would be like 0.73 minus 3.5. Oh, okay, so this is for fourth grade kids. Okay, so I'm just, I have to drill down and do this for a given set of applicants. So uh, when, I, when I report this 0.35, this is the weighted average over all of these possible fourth grade applicants, fifth grade applicants, fourth grade applicants that I get a fifth grade score for, a sixth grade score for, a seventh grade score for, uh, and that's where we get this per year effect from. Okay, so does that help, Josh? Yeah? Uh, I think I have slight improvements, so. Okay, uh, yes, okay, so let me show you another thing, okay, so um, we have some work looking at this larger set of charter schools in Boston, okay, and so Boston really kind of is ground zero for the debate about the charter cap happening right now. Uh, and so this is uh, some descriptive uh, information from uh, one of our studies. Um, where uh, what we're doing is plotting the uh, test score distribution of Boston area middle school charter applicants before they apply. So this is in the baseline year. And then we're going to follow winners versus losers in year one, year two, and year three. Okay. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> um, now um, what we have here in the top are those who lost the lottery, and what we have on the bottom are those who won the lottery. And I'm showing you two different um, distributions, uh, blue represents uh, black students, white represents, uh, red represents white students. So if we have a fair lottery, it should be the case that these two distributions look very similar, the winners versus the losers, before you participate in the lottery. Okay, this is the baseline year. If a coin flip determines your assignment, there should be no difference between the blue line here and the blue line here and the red line here and the red line here. And indeed, when you do the statistical test, there's no difference. So let's now follow this cohort forward where we know that uh, bottom panel wins the lottery and the top panel does not win the lottery. Uh, I'll make one comment that's uh, quite important is most of our applicants at these schools are actually black students in Boston. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what happens after year one? So the bottom uh, two uh, distributions uh, between black and white students uh, uh, get much closer to one another. Okay. Whereas the students who've lost the lottery still, there's this divergence between black and white students. Let's look at year two. So this is now seventh grade. Uh, we continue to see the divergence among the students who lost the lottery, and uh, we have uh, uh, further convergence for those who won the lottery. And finally, when we get to uh, the uh, last year that we can study for these kids, uh, we see what I just alleged, okay, so that winning the lottery uh, uh, for this sample, narrows the black white, and it's it's gone. All right. The, whereas for the lottery losers, we still have this divergence. This is driven by a couple of things. One thing that's very important is these uh, schools in Boston are unusually effective for black students. Okay, so white students tend to come into these schools with higher baseline scores. We saw that. I mean, uh, this is the baseline year, so the white distribution is all the way to the right compared to uh, to black students. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> Uh, um, so black students are catching up to white students uh, here in this sample. Um, now, um, it's it's basically a zero for the white students. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, what is it about these charter schools in Boston that uh, are producing kind of these dramatic effects? So that's a work that we've looked at in, in other studies. So. Uh, in a paper in uh, 2013 in the American Economic Journal, we collected the lo largest set of lottery records uh, uh, of any study uh, to date uh, from the state of Massachusetts. So there we took records from lotteries, just like in the KIPP case. We went to all schools in Boston. We went to schools throughout the state that conducted lotteries and uh, repeated our study design. Okay, uh, And... Um, the kind of bottom line of that uh, um, <clears throat> investigation is, is here. Um, uh, so I'm plotting uh, lottery-based estimates for uh, three different categories. Okay, so on the uh, x-axis here, I have math effects. On the y-axis, I have English language arts effects. And what I want to point out here is a couple of things. So the first thing is not all schools are actually creating positive effects. Okay, so this is the zero, zero point. We have a cluster of schools in the bottom quadrant. 
these are all charter schools, okay? So it's definitely not the case that all charters are effective, okay? The heterogeneity is incredibly important here. Uh, so in the bottom quadrant, we have... Uh, the non-urban schools are also fairly much clustered on that. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. so what stands out... Does that out? mean that the, the, the non-urban regular schools are already pretty good, so you can screw it up, or...? It's a fantastic question, actually, right? So as Jennifer pointed out, there's something different about the colors in this bottom quadrant than in the upper right quadrant, right? So the upper right quadrant are mostly urban schools and mostly schools that we call no-excuses schools based on surveys of school practices. Um, so they're high in their standards and... It's think of KIPP, I mean... You can't wiggle out of your homework. Basically. You can't wiggle out of your homework. Uh, I mean, they actually suspend students at a much higher rate, so that's something that... Uh, the state has actually clamped down on that because of I mean, concerns. The it's just stunning. So the non-urban, so there's a couple of things that are stunning here, right? So the non-urbans are here. Uh, I mean, remember, these are lottery studies. So that means all of these schools are oversubscribed. So even though at this school here, OK, uh, I can't tell you what school that is, this had just a lottery for three consecutive years. Wow. So children, parents are queuing to get their kid into the school, yet their achievement is going down both in math and English. Uh, now, why is this? So, so that's the topic of that paper in the, in the AEJ. And uh, there's a couple of candidate hypotheses. So one hypothesis is that the students who are attending these schools are different in terms of their characteristics. So we tend to see at non-urban schools, the types of uh, pupils who go to a non-urban charter school actually uh, uh, are reflective of non-urban districts. Okay? So that means they're much more likely to be white. They're much less likely to get a free and reduced price lunch and they tend to have a higher baseline score than the state. So it could be that charter schools are just not effective for students like that, okay? these positively selected students. Uh, another uh, candidate hypothesis is the fallback option. So I lottery into a charter school. If I don't get into that school, I typically go to the traditional host district school. So in Boston, if I don't win a lottery in, in Boston, then I go to one of the schools that may not be a good fit for me. Whereas in the suburbs, I go to a, maybe a halfway decent a suburban public school. Okay? And then the final kind of hypothesis is this no excuses hypothesis, that it's really the practices at the school. Okay? So um, here... Um, but are the non-urban ones all, uh, all non-no excuses? Yes. They're all, they're all non-no excuses. In I fact, see. they... they uh, actively, uh, uh, you know, they, they, these are the groups that hate standardized tests, for instance, okay? So, it, you know, there's a bit of a story of kind of oh, horizontal so differentiation. tend to make people select into that. Yeah, exactly, right. So, I mean, I think what's going on at non-urban charter schools, something bad happened to you at your, you know, suburban high school or middle school, so you kind of, you're upset about the teacher or you're having some uh, personal problems with some students, so you opt out for the non-urban schools. And uh, um, these guys are not kind of no excuses by, by any means, right? So, so when you actually, when you do the entire kind of accounting of these three factors, students are different, the outside option is different, and the school practices are different. Our paper argues that most of it's coming from the school practices, actually, okay? So, uh, um, and so that, that kind of led to this uh, hypothesis that you know, we have, and Roland has been also pushing about no excuses uh, uh, being at the heart of the success of these uh, charter schools. Okay? So let me not get into the details of how we did that accounting, because I want to show you some other stuff. So one thing that people often say is, well, maybe urban Massachusetts schools are special. Okay? And indeed, there are uh, nationwide reports uh, put up by groups that uh, have other methods. They're not lottery-based methods that are often quoted in the media. So uh, the standard quote is, uh, every, for every tr good charter school, there's a bad charter school. Okay, so the Credo Report, uh, this group at Stanford, uh, is very well known for saying this, that uh, uh, you know, on average... Roland's like done his no excuses type of analysis in many, in Chicago, Houston. Uh, he's only in, done it in New York and Houston. In, in, yeah, in yeah, New so in, in New York, uh, he has a paper that's kind of, actually, they were published back to back in the same oh, issue sure. of the journal okay. on this. Uh, so he, he has, okay. uh, the Houston thing is, uh, I'll come to that actually, it's, it's, okay. it's kind of related to this. So uh, um, what, what happened in Houston is Roland went and took t uh, uh, five schools and he uh, ran those schools, okay? Right. And the idea was, let's, let me try to introduce some of these no excuses practices. 
Uh, it turns out they're actually doing this without Roland's involvement anywhere, and this is happening throughout the country, okay? So this is what's called a, a charter school takeover. So the federal government, Ar Arne Duncan, was famous for doing this in Chicago. Um, he's the Secretary of Education. He, uh, 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 he came in and uh, he authorized federal funds to go to whole school turnarounds, okay? This is where you take a traditional public school that's struggling, and you have uh, uh, authorize, you have uh, um, organizations bid for the right to take over and operate that school. And what's interesting about this is um, if you look at New Orleans, okay, uh, in New Orleans most of the charter schools there are actually takeovers. They're not brand new startup schools. So KIPP, for instance, does not engage in takeovers. They only do startup schools. They say we want to build the school up grade by grade. It's too hard to take over a school because we have to take on all the problems that those schools uh, uh, come with. Uh, so um, what, what's happened in New Orleans now, uh, uh, in 2014, New Orleans became the first district in the United States that's 100% charter. So every single public school in New Orleans is a charter school. Okay. Now the, Washington, D.C. is the next district. It's about 60% of schools there are charter schools. Okay. In Boston, we have a cap, so 35% of enrollment is at charter schools. Um, and so uh, in other work, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, we've tried to study the effects of uh, being grandfathered into a charter school through a takeover. Okay, so this is interesting because takeovers are happening. Moreover, the types of students who are grandfathered in, they're passively enrolled. They're not the kid who's got the parent who figured out when lottery night is, how you apply, what the deadlines are. So, and you see that. I mean, in terms of their attributes, they're really negatively selected. So their scores tend to be much lower coming in, uh, so on and so forth. So, we can do the same kind of analysis uh, as I just showed you for the lottery study uh, with the following assumption that if we look at the set of schools that were uh, potentially going to be taken over, um, the students at those schools look similar to schools that were not taken over once we condition on the appropriate strata. Okay, So that's the idea uh, of our study. And let me just show you one quick thing about New Orleans. So here is the growth of charters in New Orleans. Okay, So at the Recovery School District, the, do, the solid line are all takeovers, okay? So this is the schools that are taken over. By 2014, uh, more than 20 charter schools are these takeovers, okay? And there are outfits that specialize in takeovers, like Renew, Crescent City, First Line. Each of those operate five or six schools now, okay? Uh, KIPP also operates in New Orleans, and it's an example of a startup school. So initially, uh, in the early part, uh, you know, of 2000, post-Katrina, most of the charters were actually these startups, but that's... Uh, become unfashionable, okay? Because it's so much. It's like they have an easier lift, okay? When you're a startup. Uh, so what's the effect size in New Orleans, okay? Uh, so we can uh, um, look at this, uh, and here's a, a figure from that paper. Um, so in New Orleans, we have uh, on the left here we've plotted your math score for children who are eligible for grandfathering. So that's this dark black line, and children who are ineligible. This is this gray line. Okay, this is our matched sample. Uh, we do the matching as of year minus one, okay? In year zero, you're at the school that then gets announced to be taken over, and then we can see your achievement not only in year zero, but in year one and year two. And uh, that's on the left we have math, on the right we have English. Uh, a couple of things to point out here is, if I look at the baseline year when we do the match, we have a remarkable parallelism for the kids that we compare those. So it seems like we have something approximating a lottery, okay? The other thing to point out is by the time we get to the end, uh, two years out, the achievement levels of the students who were eligible for grandfathering, their school was taken over, uh, far surpassed those that are ineligible for grandfathering. Okay? And so the paper goes on to turn this into a per year estimate. The last thing I want to point out, and this is quite interesting, and this is why this requires a fair amount of work, is let's look at the legacy year, the last year that you're there. You see there's actually a divergence in the opposite direction. Okay? And so, Think about what's happening. You're, you're at this school. It's December. They announce your school is going to be shut down. It's going to be taken over. Okay? It's not surprising that the children who are at that school, the grandfathering eligible kids, their achievement is actually lower in that closure year than children who are uh, their matched twin. Okay? Yeah, it's pretty so, much all the teachers go when this happens. Right. So, the, so why are they going to... Why are they going to encourage the students yeah. to achieve at all? Yeah, so there's a potential direct effect of a takeover announcement that we have to adjust for in this work. And uh, another thing that we have to adjust for in this work is the fact that 
I said by the end of 2014, every charter, every school in New Orleans is a charter school. So if we want to say what's the effect of a charter, our counterfactual is changing over time. So when we go through all the kind of econometrics of that, uh, we find charter effects uh, of 0.35 standard deviations for math and 0.15 for, uh, for English. Um, and uh, I think this is valuable because it shows that the Massachusetts results are, are not unique. So we have another site, uh, Massachusetts, uh, New Orleans. Another site is Denver, actually. So this is what I talked about in our lunch a couple of weeks ago. So Denver is a very unique site because it's the first district to actually unify admissions to charters and traditional publics under one application. Okay, so that, by the way, that's an ongoing discussion in Boston right now. So uh, there are efforts to try to have a single application where you just rank schools and they go through a centralized matching algorithm. Um, so in Denver, what happened starting in 2012, students could rank up to five choices uh, and they would receive priority based on various criteria like where they live and their uh, income eligibility. Uh, and they use a centralized matching algorithm, Gell and Shapley's Deferred Acceptance Algorithm, okay, that many of us have studied here, um, including when Nicole and I were grad students. Uh, and so what's cool about this is uh, there's some randomness embedded in the match, okay? And the randomness can happen at first choices, at second choices, at lower choices. So the question is how do you extract the randomness in the most efficient way to actually approximate what I just showed you from KIPP, okay? So we solved that problem, so let me skip over uh, that and just show you the result before getting to the very last topic. When we solve that problem, if we look at math effects here, so let's just focus on column one. Uh, in Denver, the math effect of winning a seat at a charter is uh, 0.5 standard deviation. So this is even larger than in Boston and New Orleans. So I, I think it's fair to say there is this consistent picture emerging that urban charter schools, Denver is mostly a no excuses district, so there's actually a bunch of KIPP schools here. Uh, are changing the dial uh, for these kids, at least on short run assessments. We've done work looking at medium term assessments like college going and SAT performance uh, in Boston. Uh, the kids are now old enough that we can see that more kids are going to four year colleges and you're getting about 100 points uh, boost on your SAT scores, okay? Yeah, there's this gradient, the weaker kids tend to benefit more. So that's a, actually a perfect segue to talk a bit about another project. So uh, what if instead of focusing on children at the lower tail of the baseline score distribution, we think about kids at the higher tail, okay? And so that's uh, what uh, exam schools are uh, geared for, okay? So what is an exam school? An exam school is a selective public school where you take a co competitive admissions test to get into. So the most famous exam school is Stuyvesant High School. Um, that's in New York City. Bronx Science is probably the second most famous. When I was a kid, there was a TV show about Bronx Science. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in upstate New York, so I used to dream about going to these schools. Uh, in Boston, we have the Boston Latin School, the oldest high school in America. Uh, has anyone here gone to an exam school? I know one person went to Brooklyn Tech, right? Okay, so uh, the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have tons of MIT students. Right, yeah, Richard Feynman, right, is the famous Stuyvesant grad. No Melkies, I mean, the list is an impressive list. So uh, our question uh, in this project is to try to understand uh, whether the uh, spectacular achievement for kids at these schools is due to the selection process uh, or is due to actual value added at this school, okay? And, it, and it's a question that I face every day teaching at MIT. Am I, I have some very bright students. Am I adding any value to them or not? Uh, and the way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to uh, exploit the admissions process, okay? And so uh, the idea of our study is a, a regression discontinuity. So we're going to compare the last kid to qualify for one of these schools to the first kid not to qualify. And say, you know, they basically got the same score on the admissions test, but one got to go to the better school and one did not. So let me show you how that plays out. Uh, uh, now it's a little bit more complicated than a simple discontinuity because we have multiple schools. But here we have Boston, okay, and I'm plotting whether or not you got an offer at uh, a Boston exam school at the three cutoffs. So the O'Brien school is here, Latin Academy is here, and the Latin school is, is there on the right, okay? Uh, and uh, let's see, how much time do I have? 
actually, I don't have much, much more time. So let, let me skip to the second one here, okay? So, yeah, so the y-axis is whether or not you got an offer. So the fraction of kids who have a test score of, you know, just above the cutoff who got an offer. Okay, so I've skipped to the next plot here because there's a couple of things going on here. So the dark line here indicates offer at that particular exam school in the plot here. So at the O'Brien School, if I'm to the left, I don't get an offer, right? I didn't qualify. If I'm to the right, uh, nearly all of us get an offer, okay? It's almost 100%. Uh, and uh, as I go further and further to the right, this number goes down because kids who go further to the right are now qualifying at the next higher school, okay? So that's what this is uh, intended to show. If I look at the dotted line, offer at another exam school, you see these kids are now getting offers at the next best school. Same kind of thing is going on here at Latin Academy. When I uh, look at, did I qualify Latin Academy, uh, I don't qualify if I'm below the cutoff, but if I'm to the right, uh, I see that uh, uh, <clears throat> most of these kids are getting offers. Now, why is this not 100%? It's because some of these kids actually said, I'd rather go to O'Brien, okay? Um, and then as we go to the right, this share goes down, and we see more kids getting offers uh, at, la at the Latin school, okay? So uh, thinking about what we're actually measuring here is somewhat subtle, uh, and so... Um, let, me, let me just show you the same thing is going on in New York City. Okay, so here is Brooklyn Tech. I clear the cutoff. Do I get an offer? I only don't get an offer if I've ranked another school uh, ahead of Brooklyn Tech. Same thing at Bronx Science and same thing at Stuyvesant. How do we make sense of this? I, uh, we think the best way to kind of put this into some perspective is to parameterize these schools in terms of peers. Okay, so what's the average characteristic, what's the average achievement level of your peers at these schools. So that's what we have here for uh, New York City. So we've taken New York City score distribution and said, if you didn't, qual if you didn't clear the cutoff at uh, Brooklyn Tech, you're going to go to a high school where your typical classmate has 0.5 standard deviation achievement. Okay, this is their achievement before high school. Whereas when I clear the cutoff here, my achievement level of my peer goes up by more than half a standard deviation. The same thing is happening at Bronx Science. It's not quite a half a standard deviation, a little bit smaller, but there is a jump, okay? And then by the time we get to Stuyvesant, uh, we're back to roughly half a standard deviation. So you might say, how can we actually tease out Sty versus Bronx Science versus Brooklyn Technical? Uh, these are all great schools, but this shows you that there's still a pretty sharp gradient that people who get into Stuyvesant typically want to go there over the other schools. So they get the most highly qualified uh, kids. Um, now, let me make one other comment. So we're looking at this in Boston. We're looking at this in New York. New York's exam schools are on a whole nother level than Boston's in terms of selectivity, okay? So the average SAT score at Stuyvesant on the 1600 scale, uh, the last time I looked this up was 1420, okay? The average SAT score at MIT was like 1480 that year, okay? Uh, when you go to uh, Bronx Science, it was about 1330. When you go to Brooklyn Technical, it was about 1250. 1250 is rough. Very good. I mean, the nationwide median is supposed to be 1,000. 1250 is roughly where Boston Latin is, okay? When I go from Latin to Latin Academy, I go from about 1250 to about 1100. When I go from Latin Academy to O'Brien, okay, remember, this is a selective school in Boston where you take a com competitive admissions exam to get into. The average SAT score at O'Brien is 950. Okay, that's below the nationwide median. Just for reference, the average SAT score at Lexington High School is about 1,300. Newton's about 12, 1,280. Brookline is about you know, 1,300 as well. Acton, I think, is the highest, but it fluctuates a little bit. Okay? Wow, so Bronx Science and Stuyvesant are I'm sorry? They are. No, it's, uh, it's massively oversubscribed. Uh, Can we give Brock like three minutes just to finish it? Yeah. Okay, so... If we really believe in pure effects, if we really believe in selective education, our hope is when I look across the threshold here, we see a difference in achievement, okay? So let's take a look at the graphical evidence and then we kind of go through the details in the paper. So uh, our first outcome here is advanced math regents. So um, uh, for those of you in the New York system, this is typically taken in 11th grade, but if you're a sty kid, you're probably taking this in 10th grade, trigonom pre-calculus basically. Uh, and you can see there's no difference across the threshold. Uh, what about in Boston? Uh, here are grade 10 math scores, uh, no difference across the threshold. Who cares about these standardized tests? You could tell me. So why don't we look at SAT scores? Uh, there's no difference uh, in SAT scores. This may seem like a difference, but this is an optical illusion when you do the econometrics. It's not statistically significant. 
Um, and then, uh, let's see, so I didn't add the college results here, but you're not likely to go to a better college. Uh, you're not more likely to go to any college. There's no effect across outcomes we can track in the college. Okay, uh, so the title of this paper is called The Elite Illusion, okay, uh, because uh, um, there, uh, <coughs> these students at exam schools are doing well, but it's not because of the school, at least at these cutoffs, okay. And we've also done some recent work on Chicago's uh, exam yeah, schools. Yes. <laughs> and it's also a boondoggle to teach at one of these schools uh, at Stuyvesant, just like it's a boondoggle to teach at MIT. The housing prices in fancy areas are all overpriced because it's So I, I think that's a really deep point. I, I, I should wrap up here that the ability for families to accurately assess value added, uh, I think, is not uh, very strong. And unfortunately, that dictates many choices that we make in life. So yeah, so let me wrap up here. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Glenn. Okay. Great.